Today, I wanna to try to give you a crash course on making projects that move. This video is actually part of a series on automation and bringing your projects alive in general. There are a lot of ways to make your projects move, but fortunately, I've got a huge catalog of projects that we can refer to doing everything from electric actuators, rotary tables, I've built all sorts of power tools. I even built this multi-axis robot arm behind me that can give you very complicated motions, all programmable, of course. So we have a lot of examples we can point to. I've made all sorts of little gadgets like this transparent pneumatic actuator here to show you how these things work. I'll also be referencing other videos where you can dive a little bit deeper on any particular topic. But my primary goal is to get you started on your project. Okay, we had a lot of ground to cover, so let's jump right in. I wanna start by going over some engineering concepts or design tips and tricks, things that can really trip you up when you first start designing machines that move. And I wanna start with this pneumatic actuator here. I've got it pretty well balanced and you can see this fish scale is under tension. It should just barely be tugging on it and it's basically zero. And if we hang a weight on the other end, so we're reading about three pounds of force in this direction because there's a torque now it's wanting to tip about this point, and that's pulling the fish scale up. But if we move the actuator out, 6.7, 6.8 pounds. So just by moving the actuator to the left, we've doubled the force on the scale. And this brings me to concept number one, which is forces can change dramatically, even though the total weight has stayed the same. The second thing that's happening here is the center of gravity has shifted over in this direction, right? Which means that even if this can handle all the forces, including doubling the force in this case, uh, your machine might tip over, right? Or you might be unbalanced. Now this is pretty easy to see in this, you know, two dimensional representation of the concept, but it can be pretty deceptive, especially because most of the time you're designing this in CAD, right? You're not going straight out and building it, you make a 3D model first. And the 3D model is static, it's not moving. And if you don't remember to position the model in all of the possible configurations that you'll see it in, check the center of gravity and make sure all the forces are appropriate in all of the positions, uh, you may end up with a machine that will break on you unexpectedly because forces suddenly doubled in a way that you didn't expect. There's one more concept I wanna show you while I'm here and that is there's a difference between a static load and a dynamic load. Static loads you already know. You build a table, you make sure it's strong enough to hold itself up and anything that you put on top of it, right? But dynamic loads can be really interesting. When things move, there are new forces at play. For example, we're going to put this back on here. All right, and we got the same three pounds of tension force we had here, but now watch the scale. You can see that on the scale, we were getting numbers higher than the numbers we were reading before. And not only that, the whole thing was rocking around, right? There are additional forces at play now because we're trying to accelerate the load. So not only do we have the static load, just the weight of it, there's an additional force created by trying to accelerate it. So here's a great example you can try at home. Grab yourself something a little bit heavy. A gallon of milk is about eight pounds or four kilograms. This is two and a half kilograms or about five and a half pounds. We're gonna take this, extend your arm straight out, and then swing it forward and swing it to the side as quickly as you can. And immediately you'll see just how difficult this is because moving it very slowly, you feel almost nothing. It's just the static load of trying to hold the weight up. But now you've got an additional force there trying to accelerate the mass. That's what I want you to feel. The take home message here is the faster you try to move things, the greater the forces it will have on your machine. This also means that testing at lower speeds may not tell you how it's really gonna behave at full speed. And so you need to beef things up to make sure it can handle those additional forces. You wanna make sure you've spent some time thinking about the joint itself that will be moving. Whether it's a hinge or a bearing or whatever it is, you wanna be sure that you have the right number of degrees of freedom, if you will, right? Okay, so let's look at some quick examples. Here we've got a basic hinge joint. This is one degree of freedom because you can only rotate about this one axis. It's constrained in every other direction and not allowed to move. If you want two degrees of freedom, you might do something like a cylinder inside a cylinder. 
right? It can translate in and out and it can rotate. But you gotta be careful because sometimes you can get unwanted movement. Pneumatic cylinders are designed to move in and out like this, but they're also free to rotate, right? You've got two degrees of freedom. So if you look here, you can pivot about this axis and that might lead to unwanted motion since generally you aren't designing something with an actuator like this to rotate about this axis. Basically you have two options. You can constrain whatever's attached here at the end to keep it from rotating, or you might use an actuator like this where it's got two rails and so there's built-in constraint keeping it from rotating. A ball and socket joint will give you three axes. You got X, Y, and then you can also rotate about the Z. And this can keep going. Generally you have the most control when you only allow for one degree of freedom but these can be stacked in ways to give you more complex movements. Even my robot arm technically only has one degree of freedom in each joint, but it's designed in such a way that I have many more degrees of freedom of movement to get the end effector in the position that I want, you know, twisting the head around or whatever I need to do by combining um, those individual degrees of freedom. Now it's certainly possible to design and control joints with more degrees of freedom, but the trade-off is far more complexity in both the design and the control of this joint. So this clip is a great example of that. I'll put a link in the description. It's hard to talk about making things that move without at least mentioning roller bearings. Bearings come in a huge assortment of sizes, configurations, and design purposes. That's really why I wanted to bring this up because you want to make Take a moment to figure out if you're using the right kind of bearing for your needs. You know, roller bearings aren't the only kind that you can use. You know, there's these uh, needle bearings like this, which are really good for high speed applications. They also have this really small profile, which has been very helpful for me in several applications. This kind of bearing is called a thrust bearing and it's designed to bear loads uh, in this direction while allowing things to spin. There are many specialty bearings, like there are ones with a one-way clutch that will allow the bearing to spin forward but not spin backwards. So if you wanna prohibit the bearing from spinning in reverse, you have that kind of option. When I was designing my robot arm, I used several cross roller bearings. And guess what? When I started designing the robot arm, I didn't know that there was a such thing as a cross roller bearing. It was me looking for a bearing to fit my design criteria. I stumbled across this thing called a cross roller bearing. I was like, oh, that's exactly what I'm looking for. I didn't know it existed. It's also worth saying you may not need a bearing at all. Maybe you just want to use uh, a little sleeve, which is designed to allow for lower friction without having rollers. Sometimes they're called journal bearings or sleeve bearings, but you have many different options available and it's worth taking a moment to find out which one you actually need for your application. You can save a lot of money using a sleeve bearing or you can destroy your part by not using a bearing that can handle the speed on and off. Research your bearings, you may find exactly what you want and not even know it exists. Speaking of finding the right bearing, you should definitely avoid making custom bearings or custom fasteners or any kind of part that already has a lot of variability available in the market. It's almost always better to find something good enough that's a commercially available part than it is to make a custom version. But of course, we're talking about a custom creation, so there's very likely gonna be some custom parts. Of all of my projects, this would definitely be the one with the most custom parts inside of it. Because the whole point of the project was to build a custom robot from scratch, I really wanted to make every part of the robot myself, and I did. Okay, actually, I did subcontract a few of the manufacturing steps to my children. But look, if they're gonna be in the shop with me anyway, they might as well get to work and learn a few things along the way. So they did help with some things. However, a year or so after making this thing, I did have a few pieces that I damaged in an incident we won't be discussing here. <laughs> and I needed to remake those parts. Several of these parts are pretty complex and were really difficult to make, especially the really tiny pieces that are curvy and also hard to hold on to in the machine. I didn't want to make those parts again, so I decided to get PCB Wave, today's sponsor, to make those parts for me. All I had to do was send them the 3D model, they machined it and sent it back to me. The parts look great, they fit the tolerance requirements that I gave, it was simple and easy. I've used them several times to get parts machined, especially parts that would be difficult or impossible for me to make, like I don't have a lathe, for example, so round parts I usually send to them. I even had some very large resin 3D prints <laughs> shipped to my house one time for a giant project I was working on 
one. There's even a video about that. I'll put a link in the description. So if you need something 3D printed, bench sheet metal, CNC machining, or a custom PCB like the name suggests, reach out to PCB Way. There's a link in the description and they'll take care of you. For this next tip, I need to tell you a quick story. So I was designing a machine that was a human operated. I can't show you a picture of it, but basically there was this really heavy arm that needed to be adjusted up and down with some regularity and with a fair amount of precision. My idea was to use a rack and pinion like this, except it was vertical, of course, and it would be adjusted up and down by a handle so the, the worker could crank it and lift the load up to exactly where they want it. And then there was a ratchet that kept it from going in reverse. The problem was this thing was so heavy, it took way too much force to turn the handle and move this thing up to the position that we wanted it to go up to. I didn't want to motorize it, so I thought, Maybe what I'll do is I'll use gears, right? I can reduce the amount of force needed to turn the crank and therefore we can get this thing to the right position without too much trouble. But there's a trade-off with gears that I really didn't want in this particular application. And the basic trade-off is, is you reduce the force needed to turn the handle, but you have to turn the handle more. It's this trade-off that allows us average humans to lift up a car with a jack. You can feverishly crank that jack, but the car is just barely moving a few inches. You're lifting thousands of pounds, but it takes longer. That's the trade-off. Gears are just levers, and the levers help you exchange the amount of force you need to apply compared to the distance you need to move it. In other words, if I cut the load in half that the worker needs to apply, I double the distance that the handle needs to move to get the load into the right position. For this application, the time it takes to adjust this arm is actually pretty important to me. A fellow engineer walks up behind me and he looks at the screen for all of 10 seconds. And I tell him this is what I'm trying to do. And he says, why don't you use a counterweight? And this is the thing that I want you to get from this lesson. First, let me show you why a counterweight is such a good idea. So here's our mass that we want to lift. And according to the scale, it is 8.3 pounds. Instead of lifting it directly, let's throw this over a pulley like so. So roughly the same 0.8 pounds, but the magic, if we add a counterweight, now you can see the force required is quite a bit lower. And even better than that, if you make the counterweight the same as the thing you're trying to lift, then the only force you need to apply is whatever force it takes to overcome the friction in the system. It's a really clever, really simple design. We've reduced complexity with this. We reduced cost, because now all we have to do is buy a pulley and a dumb block of steel as opposed to a gearbox or a complex series of custom gears. The only real downside is I've increased the weight of this device, but the total change in weight is negligible compared to the weight of the whole machine, which would have to be moved in one unit. So that's not even a trade-off for my application. So there are two lessons we can get from this actually. The first one is using a counterweight reduces the amount of force you need to move your load, if it's opposing gravity at least. This is how elevators work. There are so many places where I've seen this applied. And this brings me to number two, which is sometimes really simple solutions, even ones that you're aware of, you may not be thinking about in your specific application. So sometimes it's helpful to walk away from your project for a little while, just let it rest, and it may come to you later. Or similarly, you could let someone else look at your project. Even if they're not an engineer, having someone look at your project with fresh eyes can give you a new perspective and you may come up with solutions you haven't thought about before. I mentioned gears a moment ago and this reminded me of another use of gears, which is using them to change the direction of rotation. When I spin this gear clockwise, you'll see this one is going counterclockwise. And I've used that both when designing my clocks, but also in machines where I have a motor that I don't wanna have to reverse the direction or the motor can't be wired to spin in reverse. The engine in your car, for example, only spins forward. It's the transmission, a series of gears, that allows you to put your car in reverse. You can have two sets of gears that you can switch back and forth between, one with three gears and one with just two. They can have the same number of teeth so that you don't change the gear ratio if you don't want to, or you can do both, have reverse go at a slower speed and forward go at a faster speed. You have a lot of options there. So the point is, there's another clever use for gears other than changing the gear ratio, 
and that is also changing the direction of rotation. It can be easy to confuse strength with stiffness, and if you don't keep these two things straight in your mind, it can lead to poor design choices. Here's a real quick example. I've got a piece of wood here and a piece of aluminum. They are cut to the same thickness and overall dimensions, which means I have the same volume of material in wood and aluminum. So let's say I'm designing something with this piece of wood. I've got an overhung load and I notice that the wood is sagging, right? It almost looks like a diving board. You might be tempted to use a stronger material, but if I change the geometry, I can solve the real problem by making the structure stiffer. So just by orienting the same amount of material in line with the direction that the load was being applied, I was able to carry significantly more load even with a cheaper material. So the moral of the story is the shape and orientation of your part relative to where the load is matters just as much as the material that you're using. Along the same lines, if your primary load was horizontal instead of vertical with gravity, then you would want to orient it this way so that you would maximize the use of your material in line with the load that's being applied. If you look back through some of my older videos, you'll see I've actually built quite a few power tools using wood as structural material and those machines worked just fine. They were stiff enough and adequate to get the job done. Was it as good as building it out of steel? Well, no, but I had different goals at the time. I had limited budget. I didn't have the tools I needed to make the things I wanted, so I built the tools that I needed so that I could make the things that I wanted. And over time, I was able to save up and I slowly exchanged some of those uh, wooden tools that I built, which served their purpose at the time for tools made out of steel. Okay, there are a lot of other things I want to say about how to design the actual thing itself. But fortunately, I've covered this quite a bit in the past. So there are two videos in particular I want you to see. If you want more information on that, again, links in the description. But there's one more concept that is so crucial, it's worth bringing up here. Engineering is all about trade-offs. There's no such thing as a perfect design. And the most common mistake that I see people make that I wanna address here is they go, oh, you should just use X because it's good at Y, or my grandpa said you should use X. The problem with that is you haven't fully defined the problem and you may be solving the wrong issue. Let's just make up a quick example to make sure you understand exactly what I mean. Okay, I need a vehicle that can go off-road. Now, most of us will get an instant picture based on our own experience of what that off-road vehicle looks like, but does this actually solve the problem? You may be bringing the wrong solution to your customer. So we need to be sure that we understand all of the requirements and constraints that our customer has given us. Maybe they tell us they wanna be able to carry a load with them. You know, how heavy is this load? Well, if you keep asking, you might find out that actually they only need to carry a few things and speed is the most important variable to them. And this is where the compromise starts because in general, if you want more speed, you usually need to decrease the weight. Do you have any other requirements? Or maybe they say speed is not as important as durability. I need this thing to be able to take a hit and keep going. Okay, well this produces a whole new set of trade-offs, right? We're gonna be giving up a little bit of speed. We're definitely gonna be increasing the cost, the materials that we're using. But if you say, I need like the most budget-friendly speed I can get, it's important to remember you don't just need to know what they want, you need to know how much they want. How much speed do you really want? How much capacity do you actually want? How much durability do you really want? And how much are you willing to pay for those features? There are a wide range of interpretations available for whatever you might think you want. And if you never present these questions to your customer, which might be you in this case, you might find out that actually all they wanted was something faster than walking and they can wear a backpack. So a simple bicycle might have solved their problem. And this is what engineering is. It's an optimization with trade-offs for your specific customer. And since all of you are different customers, all of you are gonna want different things. So why am I spending so much time on this? Because I want you to know that I'm going to be giving you a bunch of pros and cons across a huge range of things, and the pros and cons that matter to you are gonna vary depending upon who the customer is, right? Some of you are gonna want the cheapest option, some of you are gonna want the most durable, the fastest, on and on. With that in mind, we're gonna be comparing actuators in the next video, pneumatic versus hydraulic versus electric actuators. And in fact, depending upon when you clicked on this video, that video may already be posted. There should be a link to that video right down here in the corner. I also wanna say thank you to my YouTube members and patrons. You guys play a huge role in me being able to make videos like this. These videos aren't necessarily viral videos that will get millions of views, but they're really helpful to makers and young engineers alike. So it was important to me to make this video and this whole series, in fact. So I hope you find it useful and 
thank my patrons and YouTube members for making it possible. All right, see you in the next video.